Okay. So today, um, we appreciate you coming out for AACC. I'm Jerry turner Jacino. I am the Vice President of Strategic Relations at ARUP. And really all that means is I'm a resource for a lot of the large healthcare systems that we work with. I get to work with Dr. Fletcher and his consultative services team, and we partner with our clients to help them maximize the value of their laboratory and what they're trying to do in outreach expansion and things within their own healthcare system. With healthcare changing at a rapid pace and uh, moving forward, it's important more than ever that laboratory and pathology plug ourselves back in to the healthcare system and try to help with some of the other uh, service lines and some of the issues that we're dealing with in the hospitals. So today, Dr. Fletcher is going to come and talk to us about di defining the downstream uh, impact of laboratory stewardship. Dr. Fletcher comes to ARUP from one of our client sites, so he's been working with ARUP and practicing some of the things that we've put into place for a long period of time. Dr. Fletcher is a licensed um, anatomic and clinical pathologist who is also a certified account executive. And Dr. Fletcher is highly regarded in the area of utilization management. He was one of the early adopters and is recognized and known and been awarded for his efforts around utilization management, uh, variation limitations in testing. And with that, I'm going to have Dr. Fletcher come up and talk about well, how thanks, important Jerry. the lab is and such an integral part of the healthcare system Good. in delivering improved patient care. So with that. Well, thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. So good morning and welcome to Anaheim and obviously the ARUP booth. Um, I see a couple of familiar faces. For those of you I haven't met before, I'm Dr. Fletcher. I was originally born in Australia and then I moved to South Georgia. So I got probably the most messed up accent you'll ever hear. <laughs> so in any case, I'm a pathologist and um, a few years ago I started the laboratory stewardship program and very quickly we got things like consolidation uh, laboratory formularies and in-house testing under control. Now consolidation for me, that meant I had doctors sending tests everywhere. We had to get that under control. We had to put together a laboratory formulary. And last year I spoke about laboratory formularies um, um, in Chicago at AACC. The fir third part to that is how do you get in-house testing under control? Um, so those are three areas. If you'd like me to go over those more, meet with me um, after this presentation. But today, what I really wanted to spend a little bit of time on is looking at some of the downstream costs. So laboratory, I think everybody's seen these types of numbers before, about 13 billion tests per year in the United States. We account for about 2 to 3% of the overall healthcare spend, but we drive 70 to 80% of everything that's done in a hospital or a healthcare system. So those three things I mentioned, consolidation, laboratory formularies, and in-house testing, that's the 3%. What I want to spend some time on is looking at the 70%. How can you drive savings elsewhere through a healthcare system? So here's a couple of examples. Um, so when I was in my healthcare system, after I did laboratory stewardship for a while, the hospital asked me to start looking at some other areas, specifically case management and pharmacy. Now case management, being a pathologist, it's something I, I knew really well. Yeah, no, not really at all. So all of a sudden, one day I find myself um, as a corporate physician advisor, and they're asking me to look at things like observation length of stay, the CMS2 midnight rule, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know anything about this. Well, the first thing that really um, hit my attention was I had a chief medical officer in my office saying, what are you going to do to fix observation length of stay? Our chest pain observation length of stay was about 27 hours. And the philosophy there was, can we get it down to less than 12 hours? Because 27 hours means one patient per room per day. If you can get, get it down to 12 hours per day, that's two patients per room per day. So you double your efficiency or you have your cost. Well, I got to looking at that and I thought, well, observation length of stay, 70% of my observation patients have chest pain. This is clearly a laboratory problem. So here's a screenshot of our EMR. We had Cerner. Actually, this was Sorian that became Cerner. The same thing, Epic. You just pick whichever EMR you want. And here's a screenshot of all the different ways you could order troponin. There are actually 17 different ways. The very first one is troponin Q8 hours. So let's think about it. The patient hits the door of the emergency room, time 0, time 8, time 16. It's taken us 16 hours just to get through the troponin rule out for chest pain observation. Buried down here in the list is Q3 hours. 
So we looked at that and I thought, well, that just doesn't make sense. I think the troponin Q8 hours is a holdover from CKMB days. And as CKMB went away, we just never fixed troponin. So what does that look like on a graph? So here you can see our troponin intervals is, uh, are peaking at about six hours. And that was pretty much how it was defaulted in the order entry system. What's that big, big sp spike right there in, in 30 minutes? Those were the physicians who really wanted a point of care troponin, but didn't really quite trust it, so they also sent it to the laboratory. Well, that's nice, because I can only bill for one, and that point of care device is costing us a lot of money. So I said, well, why don't you just send it to the laboratory? Well, you guys take too long. I said, how about you label it correctly and get it sent to the lab, and we'll fix that. So they, they agreed. They said, okay, we'll give that a try. And we also changed the EMR. We defaulted everything to Q3 hours on troponins. We didn't tell people they couldn't do something different, but that's what it's going to default to. One week later, here's our troponin graph. Now we're doing troponins about three hour intervals, zero, three, and six hours. Theoretically, laboratory just saved half the time of a troponin rule out off an observation length of stay. And also the point of care has disappeared because once we uh, fixed up the pre-analytic process, we really could do the testing quickly. What did that mean for the hospital? Um, it was about a week period we shifted these curves, and I went to the, every week we had a meeting about this observation length of stay, and I was so proud to go to the next meeting because everybody looked at this data. Length of stay dropped by about five hours, and they all looked at like the data must be wrong. Nothing happened. There was no new clinical pathways. There was no new initiatives. The data is wrong. What happened? And you know what? I'm so proud to say that it, I'm still proud to say it today. I said, you know what happened? Your laboratory just happened. How much money did we save? Uh, that's always a hard question. The theory was if we could get the ch chest pain observation length of stay down to 12 hours, it would be a $30 million opportunity for the hospital. Laboratory took it from about 27 down to about 21 to 22. Was that half of 30 million? Was it 10% of 30 million? The bottom line is we're talking about millions. So real quick, we've got just a couple more minutes here. I'm going to share with you some stories about pharmacy. Now, pharmacy is fun. And later this afternoon, Dr. Kaufman will be sharing with you a lot more information about pharmacy. But one day, I went, I went to a P&T committee meeting. And honestly, it's because they serve pizza. And my residents were always hungry. And I'm like, well, pharmacy's got the best food. So we're going to go down there. So I went to a P&T committee meeting. I'm eating their pizza. And they start talking about IVIG. I'm like, IVIG, what is that, intravenous immunoglobulin or something? In any case, $2.2 million on an inpatient spend. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at that going, that's just too bad. I wish there was something I could do to help them. Not long after that, a week or two later, I got a utilization report um, from our reference laboratory, and it showed that we were responsible for about 72% of all streptococcal pneumonia IgG ordered in the United States. And I looked at that, and I was like, Go Tennessee, yeah. I mean, we're, we're knocking this thing out, not on my watch. I was like, what the heck are we even doing this test for? And so I had a first year resident, and we thought, you know, let's start looking into this. And all of a sudden, it was like streptococcal pneumonia IgG. I wonder if it's got anything to do with IVIG. Well, it turns out we have one physician who was ordering 80% of the 72%. And what was he doing? He was screening people after he gave them a Pneumovax to see if they responded with an increase in their IgG. If they didn't, guess what? They will put on IVIG. Now, it sounds really good logic, but that is not how you diagnose hypogammaglobulinemia. So in any case, about, oh, I don't know, about a month later, we went to P&T committee, and we started presenting the findings. Actually, my resident did, and it was beautiful. She was laying out this presentation, and everybody's like, wow. I mean, that's clearly contributing to the problem. At one point during the meeting, um, I think it was our CFO leaned back and asked, asked me, who is this girl? And I said, well, she's one of our first year patholo pathology residents. And he said, we have pathology residents? I was like, yeah, we have pathology residents. The next thing he said that was really serious, and again, one of those moments I look back on and go, wow, he said, quote, these guys are bringing us a lot of value. How are they being resourced? How is the laboratory being resourced? Oh, my goodness. So fast forward, it wasn't all laboratory. Pharmacy did a whole bunch of work with putting some guide rails around IVIG. 
the next year uh, laboratory, we saved about five or six thousand dollars on streptococcal pneumonia IgG testing. Pharmacy saved 1.1 million dollars. So now all of a sudden, what can laboratory do for you? Infliximab, Remicade, who's ordering neutralizing antibodies to see if patients are developing antibodies where the drug doesn't work? Remicade's about $100,000 a year. It's worth testing. Same thing with Humira. And then we also look at things like the NS5A inhibitors for hepatitis C treatment. What we tend to see over time is somebody gets diagnosed with hepatitis C and you start seeing viral load after viral load after viral load as we're monitoring to see is the patient responding to the drug. In this case, the NS5A antiviral drug. Wouldn't it make more sense to test for the resistance on the front end? So long story short here with pharmacy, I always say reach out to pharmacy, get a list of your top 10 most expensive drugs, maybe top 20. Laboratory can't touch all 10 or 20 but we can reliably touch two or three, and if we can partner with pharmacy, the savings can be huge. So that's just a couple of stories this morning about how laboratory can drive downstream savings. Um, you know, get outside the laboratory, go to the other departments. Who'd have thought laboratory could interact with case management and pharmacy? Uh, but so many times you'll see through your healthcare system where it's true, where laboratory really is driving healthcare um, today. Having said that, any questions or comments, stories to share? Yes, sir. I, I, I think here she comes. Jerry's got a microphone. Jerry, we have a question. Yes. Thank you. You sort of mentioned that neutralizing antibody mm -hmm. from a laboratory, how to test that, how to report to the physician. I'm, I'm sorry, repeat the question one more time. The neutralizing antibody, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you can provide a test and report to a um, physician, you know, to guide them to how to use that drug. Oh, absolutely. So we've seen it used a couple of different ways. The um, first healthcare system I saw really use it, they would test a patient who had a relapse of their underlying disease, so typically inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and then if they saw it, increasing antibodies. Now it's a titer, so you can actually get the level. Um, then the decision was made, do we escalate the dose or is it time to switch, put them on a different drug? The other way I've seen it used is people actually monitor the titers periodically to try to avoid a relapse. And so if the titers start to increase, they'll put them on drugs such as met methotrexate or um, azathioprine to try to modulate the levels as well. Any other questions? So we have a question that was sent in, Andrew, about some of the things that you talked about. How did you, in the past, ensure that the lab got the credit for the <laughs> interventions that you put into place? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I've been to several places telling these stories, and the laboratories told me, yeah, we, we partner with pharmacy. We partner with whoever. They got the credit, and we were like, what is wrong with laboratory? These guys are knocking it out of the ballpark, and what has laboratory done for me? I would say the most important thing is be vocal. Make it extremely clear what laboratory's role was. Um, for pharmacy, you know, I've seen a lot of places, I was just mention, mentioning neutralizing antibody studies, these are expensive tests. So unless administration is fully aware, they're gonna look at pharmacy saving the money. Meanwhile, laboratory, look at you guys, you guys are getting more expensive every year. So I'd say make it crystal clear, scream it to the rafters, let people know what, what it is you're doing in the laboratory. Another question that I'm asked when I'm out there visiting with clients and we're doing consulting engagements is, how do I engage my pathologist and get them excited about <laughs> telling physicians around new things they can do in healthcare? Well, pathologists, we're just an exciting bunch of people. We love to get out there. We're yeah, I, I try not to laugh when they <laughs> ask me that. <laughs> you, you know, I think for me, um, honestly, being a pathologist, I was paid to look at glass slides. And really, most of the time, the clinical laboratory was something I had to go out and sign some documents, but I really wanted to sign out my glass slides. And it was also, I didn't want to be in a position where I was the policeman having to argue with physicians. So for me, it was really finding those strategies where the, the medical staff would support us. Um, and once we started to come up with these strategies where we started to realize that we weren't really the policemen, we were actually the experts and people would listen to us. Um, after a while, it just kind of got to where the other pathologists were comfortable with it because they found out that the physicians really wanted them to interact and give their opinion. It's okay for us to practice laboratory medicine. 
Thank you. And I've seen that when we've been out, Andrew, when we're able mm -hmm. to talk peer to peer and you're able to share some of the successes that you've had. I've seen the pathologists actually embrace it. And but they want to see data. They want to see information. Absolutely. And that leads me to another question. So one of the other items that often comes up is how do you or how were you successful in appropriating the IT resources that you need? <laughs> and what types of things are there required to launch some of these initiatives? Oh, absolutely. IT, everybody's got tons of IT resources, don't they? <laughs> You know, I, I had mentioned laboratory formulary earlier on. So we came up with this concept of laboratory formulary and I went to IT, I was like, can we build this? And they were like, yeah, no, not today. I'll get to it after I get through with my other 900 things we're doing in the EMR. And I said, well, if you can't build the whole thing today, could you just do a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow? And they were like, oh, okay, we, okay, we'll do it. So it took a long time, it was a slow process. But when we went live with the formulary in this particular example, all of a sudden, laboratories started winning awards, the big crystal awards. And you know, when we went on the stage, you know how I dragged up there with me? The people from IT who built it, I put them on the stage and gave it to them. Now all of a sudden, when I went back to IT, they're like, well, yeah, maybe we can help you for another project. So I think part of it was, is number one, I have to respect IT. They are busy, they've got a lot of things on their plate, so I think number one is have reasonable expectations. Number two is share success, because the IT folks, you know, nobody's picking up the phone thanking them every day, but if you can give them some credit for it and, and be respectful of their time, I found over time that we'll get on board with the projects and help laboratory where possible. And that leads me to another question, Andrew, and that is, how did you, in your organization and other organizations that we work with, identify other opportunities where a lab can have a contributive value and help them garner credit for participating in solving healthcare issues? Yeah, you know, you know for me, I, I mentioned it before, um, I was eating pizza in pharmacy. <laughs> you know, I think for me, it was getting outside of the laboratory, actually putting on a white coat and joining meetings like case management. I just went there one day and all of a sudden you're like, oh, gosh, we've got laboratory opportunities here, pharmacy, radiology. So I'd say just step outside of the laboratory, 70% of what's going on will have some sort of relationship back to laboratory. I'll also tell you this quick story. Uh, I started a utilization management rotation for the pathology residents. And so the first day I told my residents, I said, grab your white coat and your stethoscope, we're going upstairs. And of course she looked at me, she's like, stethoscope. I was like, yeah, well, that's in case we run into an orthopedic surgeon. Any case, so we go upstairs and we're going to join multidisciplinary rounds. The first day we showed up and they're laughing. Well, not laughing, they're kind of snickering. Look, look at the pathologist, these resident, they're joining rounds. I wanted to step outside the laboratory and see what was going on. Pharmacy was there, physical therapy was there, dietary, the, the, the preacher was there. I was like, why can't laboratory be here? So we rounded that first day, come Friday morning, we had grand rounds and we were a few minutes late, they waited for us. Now all of a sudden they start to see the value of laboratory and by being in that multidisciplinary round, I started hearing all of these lab is issues that I never knew existed. So long answer, but back to the question, step outside the laboratory and look for opportunities everywhere you can.